It's that time, we're gonna talk about what it's been like getting off of Intel and onto AMD for our workstations. So we promised you we were gonna do this after using it for a while. We've used it for a while and now we have some opinions about it. More so Phil though, it's his computer. The Elite XG270QG from ViewSonic breaks the traditional ugly appearance of gaming monitors by providing an ultra clean design while still delivering gamers the features that they want most. Features like a one millisecond response time, IPS 165 hertz overclock display, black brushed aluminum stand with tilt and swivel, mouse and keyboard cable anchors and customizable subtle lighting. To learn more about the XG270GQ from ViewSonic and to see current pricing, click the link in the description below. So this truly is part two of the Threadripper 3000 series CPU video that we started uh, last year. So one of the things that we did when Ryzen first came out in 2016 was I switched to Ryzen for 30 days. And I went, okay, so what's it like truly using it? Because anyone could sit here and run some tests and be like, oh, okay, here's how it performed and here's our opinion. But until, unless you actually use it every day in all of your tasks and get rid of whatever you're using prior to that and commit, to only using the thing you're reviewing, you truly don't know how it performs no matter how much you think you do. So that's what we do when there's a new platform that launches. And so I did that with Ryzen. We did it with the first generation Threadripper. Um, Phil had a 1920 uh, that was running really strangely, if that makes sense. It had a lot of first generation errors and, and weird just quirkiness. He was spending more time, I feel, in the BIOS trying to get the thing to run right. But we eventually even just ran no overclock whatsoever simply because of the fact that it was being super wonky. In fact, the wonkiness right there with the coming back on, that was the Intel. Um, so we skipped 2000 series Threadripper altogether and went back to a 9900K because Phil, having been in the editing industry for well over a decade now, like 15 years or something like that, right? 10, like professionally-ish. One of the things that's always made editing on a Mac, especially MacBook Pro, so beneficial is the fact that it has QuickSync. And Intel is able to take advantage of QuickSync, which really helps with Premiere. It's what really speeds it up. It lets the iGPU become a dedicated encoder for H.264, making it a hardware encoder. So one of the things we really had to bank on moving to a 32-core, 64-thread, crazy overkill processor like this for video editing and general use purpose is that we had to hope that the brute force method would overcome the efficiency method. It's got eight, well, sit what, uh, four times, eight, 16, 24, 30. It's got four times the amount of cores and threads than Intel. Is it gonna give us four times the performance? Probably not, but we're gonna go ahead and test some things here. So our major use case here is video editing. Um, multitasking definitely sprinkled in some games. Phil does a lot of capture when we have to do screen capture or some game captures and stuff like that. So we do have an extremely overkill PC for a very, I, I don't wanna say edge use case because this is more mainstream what we do. But let's go and talk about the two systems here. It's a 9900K running at five gigahertz. It's got 32 gigabytes of Corsair Vengeance RGB memory. It's got a 2080 Ti Gaming X Trio from MSI, which is a very high-end 2080 Ti card. Um, power supply, none of that matters. It is AIO water-cooled um, with a 360 RAD versus this guy over here. So if you haven't seen the build log we did on this, it's definitely worth checking, checking out. This is when we decided to go full on Threadripper um, all in. So it's fully water cooled using Fantex water cooling gear. We've got a crap ton of fans in there, as you can see. We got 64 gigs of RAM in here. So we do have double the RAM. It does have an XC Ultra 2080 Ti from EVGA, but this card has our secret BIOS on it. So it more than makes up and the fact that it's on water over that trio. And then obviously it has got a 3970X 32 core 64 thread processor. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one of my projects from back when we were building the studio. It's a 4K scratch footage that these are identical timelines. They're, they are carbon, carbon copies of each other. So we've got the Intel running the QuickSync um, hardware encoding and then the AMD running software encoding. This is kind of the worst case scenario. It is 4K being transcoded down to 1080p because that is another intensive task. So we are adding stress to these CPUs, which is exactly what we want. So Intel using hardware encoder with the iGPU as a H.264 dedicated encoder versus just brute force software encoding. So we're gonna click these at the same time. Three, two, one, Q. So you can see we're comparing the start time of media encoder and all that such. Wow, I'm surprised it opened up faster over here in the Intel if you wanna know the truth. Yeah, you got a clock speed difference, that's why. Oh yeah, five, five gigahertz versus 4.2. Um, okay, so we're gonna do this again in three, two, one, go. 
See, the AMD is already up and running. So you can see the frame rate playback too of the little window right here. That says remaining 11 minutes, it says remaining three. <laughs> it's funny, this is like, this looks like just a, like a GIF playback rate. And that looks like a slideshow. <laughs> yeah, so it's only really using four of them solid and the rest are all sitting at like 20s and 30s. Some single digit perform, um, utilization. So the a and is about to be done. So our actual export time over here, and Phil had to go over there and grab lunch from Postmates. They called and this Intel still just going barely past the two, at the two thirds mark. Five minutes and 14 seconds. Look, I know that a lot of people probably are already angry. Like, Jay, this is not a fair test. We know that. And we also know that this, that CPU is four times more expensive than this one. But this is truly from the workstation type of category of a review where we are, time is money around here. Time that we're spent waiting for systems like this, because right now we can't do anything else on this system. Like we probably could, but it's only gonna slow down the encoding. With Adobe, it increases the likelihood of an error popping up. And then it's just not a great multitasking experience when it's being leveraged like this, because the core is being, well, you can see it right here, pegged. So we can't do anything else with this system right now. It is 100% utilized, but that is where this is where our use case is. We went from this system to this system, and this is how the performance has benefited us. But I think people might be like, Jay, if you really want to tell you should be using the Intel 39 or 3175X. Well, that one's a thousand dollars more than the AMD one, and it would still get beat in this instance because you don't have QuickSync. Oh, it's done. 10 minutes and 38 seconds versus five minutes and 14. It's literally twice as fast plus 10 seconds faster on top of that. So Phil and I have been going back and forth on how to come up with some sort of a background test where we can see multitasking. I mean, what really are we gonna do when we're not working and making videos around here? It's probably gonna be gaming, so whatever. We're just doing a CPU test though actually because we don't have identical graphics cards in here. Even if we clock them the same, this is on water, this is on air. We truly can't do an apples to apples comparison on graphics. But what we're gonna do, we're gonna run just a CPU test with Time Spy Extreme in a windowed mode. Uh, not looping or anything. We're just gonna compare the scores and compare the render times. All right, so once, it, they're both doing collecting system info. They're both on NVMe drives, so I'm curious to see which goes faster. Okay, they're both gonna be done before the stupid benchmark starts. The, that still looks just as smooth as it ever did, huh? Whoa, look at that one. Also, I think Premiere didn't even slow down that much. No. All right, a CPU score of 13,920. It almost seems like Premiere clearly took priority, right? Okay, so the CPU score over here, but it still pulled a 13,920 score while encoding 251 to 259. So it took eight seconds longer while, re while doing a Time Spy Extreme CPU test, giving us a score of 13,920 where Intel 4,609, an encode time of two minutes and 58 seconds. So it slowed down by like- Intel lost 20 seconds. 20, well, 19 seconds. Intel lost 19 seconds. I'm well aware that this is not that scientific. I know that this does not have the best controls in place, but two idiots like ourselves just clicking buttons and seeing what the numbers are is probably as realistic as you're gonna get to like a home experiment. Okay, so obviously I brought Phil in because he's the one that's been end usering this. I only recently made the switch to Threadripper on my particular workstation, which let's face it, doesn't do much besides play World of Warships, now occasionally fall in order YouTube videos and orders food. And I, to be honest, I made the switch because of your experience now versus the first time. So talk about some of like the, the idiosyncrasies or the weirdness you were experiencing before. Um, oh, on like the 1920 system? The 1920X. Uh, just, just it'd be stable one day, unstable the next day, like needed to change the voltages around. It was really picky with RAM. And like the stop code it would get stuck on when booting and stuff was different. We couldn't even determine what was Adobe weirdness mm -hmm. versus the system weirdness. Now you're using the 3970X and you've been using it now for like two months. So what's that been like? I think the best compliment I could give the system is the fact that since we built in that video, I haven't even booted into the BIOS. I did that really like, oh, we know Ryzen can go 4.2. And I left the voltage at stock. Yeah. And then I went DOCP on the memory, boot, done. 
destroy Intel. It's kind of funny, like some might look at this and go, well, this is not compelling reason for me to change my 9900K. And that's not the point of this video. Yeah. The point and is- And honestly, like, dude, for 500 bucks versus what is, what is this? $2,000. $2,000, yeah. Like, obviously the 9900K system is still a better value for the money, but like, Again, if, if you, this was an X299 CPU versus this AMD, it would be even worse. Yeah. It'd be a bigger domination, a bigger smackdown because there's no iGPU, there's no quick sync on the X299 yep. CPU. So. You would think the high-end platforms would have all that extra like hardware, but no, they only keep it on the, on mm -hmm. the consumer level stuff. But what I can say is extremely different from our experience two years ago is you're not mad at your system. In fact, I've heard Phil a so many times just sit there looking at a system going, God, I love this computer. God, yeah. this computer's awesome. I have no problems whatsoever recommending Threadripper 3000 series to anyone from just an enthusiast yep. to somebody who needs a powerful workstation that doesn't need QuickSync. It's a dope value add for editors that are, you know, looking for a, pro a processor in that price range. And, if anything, um, what yeah. we really demonstrated here right now is how important the GPU is in this workflow. Yeah. Because that's what really picked up the gap. And that is something that has changed since 2018 or earlier versions of Premiere where- I used like, to see like 5% Yeah, used. five to maybe yeah. 10. I was I was so genuinely surprised that we, we saw, you know, 20, 30% utilization. Well, in the last test, when we were getting to the point where we were in the time remapping and yeah. it went to sleep, uh, it used the GPU to do all that. Yep. And we saw the GPU go to nearly and then, 100%. And, and that's why it, it reminded me, and I was like, oh yeah, there's, there's separate options for like hardware encode, which is when you're exporting your project to the H.264 that you're gonna upload or whatever, right? And then there's hardware decode. And QuickSync does both, and the AMD system doesn't have any of that. No. And so it's literally brute forcing everything, and it's still, you know, for all intents and purposes in my workflow, it's roughly twice as fast as yeah. the Intel system. Now, now, most people would probably never notice that. You've been an editor for a long time, you know how that works. A lot of people don't put together timelines like yours. I yeah, mean, and, and you know, and you, you've seen some other, like some other people have mentioned, you know, that editing on a Mac with like Final Cut and stuff is like super fast and like, drop the A word on my channel. I know, right? But it's like, but that's why they're also leveraging all of that advantages of like um, hardware encoding and stuff, not only just on a QuickSync module, but also on all the GPUs in the system. So that's why they, they're, you know, cheating just as much as the Intel system is cheating at rendering versus yeah. this AMD thing. But this thing just has so many cores and it's, the IPC has gotten so good on Zen 2 that it just doesn't care. It just it doesn't care. Through. It's stable. It clocks well. 4.2 is where we have it. I mm -hmm. mean, what really now AMD truly needs is the clock speed to match the core capacity, right? Yeah. Um, we haven't had any weirdness with it. You've played games on it. You don't feel like you're dropping frames or losing frames. I would feel very, very entitled and spoiled if I complained about the frame rates on that computer at all. So yeah, no. Well, but it's, it's a legitimate argument sometimes. Right, that yeah, Ryzen, you're paying that much money, right? That, that Ryzen, Zen, like the Zen architecture, is not as good mm -hmm. as Intel's 14 nanometer even, high clock speed when it comes yeah. to gaming. That's why the 9900K is still known as like the dominating gaming CPU. But this is that's not what these systems were built for. But at the end of the day, if you're considering Ryzen uh, Threadripper for a lesser expensive workstation or an enthusiast build for gaming and or live streaming or just having a massive amount of cores to play with virtual machines, because think about how, virtual, how many virtual machines you could set up with this yeah. versus the 9900K, right? Just the things you could do, there's more value to it in my opinion, even though it's a $2,000 CPU. But I think we're finally at a point now here in 2020 where I can say you're not really sacrificing anything any weirdness or going, oh, okay, well, I have to accept, adopt this bleeding edge tech problem to go with this platform. I feel like it's all fixed. It's it's a little weird because it's almost like, like the graphics cards from AMD were like, you know, the CPU reliability and weirdness was like kind of down here. Yeah. And then like, now it's gotten kind of leapfrogged where like Threadrippers, this Threadripper yeah. is just so solid. Like that's what, that's my favorite thing about the machine, honestly, is that it just, it just shuts up and does it. And it does it stupid fast and it doesn't even ramp the fans up. And yeah, it and that's it. It rips it. it. Basically, I just want to kind of come back and finish up the video that we started and say, look, this has been a, a really good experience. And that's why I now have a Threadripper uh, 3960X. I have less cores <laughs> than you, but whatever, it's fine. So guys, thanks for watching. If you have anything else you'd like us to talk about with Threadripper, I don't think there's much more to mention. I mean, I think our our use case is almost a waste for this level of CP, a CP, CP. <laughs> wow, I'm gonna go now, guys. <laughs>